process virtual alloc EX, write process memory, create remote thread, right? So again, he's, he's now injected his code through explorer.exe into Internet Explorer. Now, why bother, right? Why the heck did he inject into explorer.exe in the first place? Well, the only reason is to get himself in the right place in the process tree, right? So he wanted explorer.exe to um, inject the code into MSN Messenger. Um, and if, if it didn't find MSN Messenger already existing, it would have created a new process. Right, so if MSN Messenger wasn't running, it would have created MSN Messenger. You want that child process to be a child of explorer.exe, not of um, the poison ivy rat, right, because that would have stuck around. So in the end, you get code running inside of MSN Messenger, and there's really not very many um, external indications that that process is actually malicious. Um, it doesn't sit there and listen for network traffic in a sort of a stupid way like my example did, right? It actually just connects out periodically and MSN Messenger you would expect to be connecting out on the network periodically, right? So it may not be suspicious right away unless it's going to an unusual IP address or something. Um, the hint that, that we actually used when we investigated this thing was the presence of this little, of this mutant, right, of a mutex. Um, Poison Ivy only wants to be running once on the machine and so it creates a global mutex um, and the guy who installed Poison Ivy on the machines we were investigating didn't change this value from the default. So, um, you know, that little close paren bang voqa.l4, when you search for that in Google, it takes you immediately to the forums for poison ivy rat and uh, people trying to configure their, their thing incorrectly and other stuff. So uh, it makes the malware analysis a lot easier when you get those kinds of clues. But, you know, essentially there's, there's very few flags uh, screaming out at me that, oh, this is the evil MSN messenger, right? It's, uh, there's one thread running in there inside some sections that were injected, and uh, you're just, you're end up looking for these little external signs. And so here's another, you know, just saying the same thing there. You know, even if you were running that process in a debugger, right, how the heck do you find the evil, right? Where is the bad in this slide? Well, it's here. Um, this section that's highlighted here is actually the, contains the bad stuff and you're looking at the code of it, and this is a, uh, right now you're currently sleeping, waiting for the next connection. But, uh, you know, it really poses quite a problem for the investigator, right, who's used to looking for uh, malicious, unusual processes. And they know what processes are supposed to be on a system, but when you have to take things down to the thread level, right, it makes things much, much harder. And uh, it's even worse if you're looking at things after the fact and all you have is, is a disk image to do forensics on, right? In that case, you're, you're kind of sunk. So we need something better, right? Testing. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to cover, uh, Chris has done a great job of covering some of the tools out there for user mode uh, process injection. We're going to cover here uh, kernel mode process injection. So this would take place from a driver. Again, you might think if you're a kernel mode driver, why in the world would you want to inject into an existing user land process? The reason he's already stated basically is to bypass uh, personal firewalls, things like that. You can also use this method in order to gain um, access to handles that you normally wouldn't have had access to. So if a handle is marked as inheritable, within the parent process that you inject within, then your child process or child DLL would also have access to this handle. So what comprises a process? It has two halves. There's a lot to do with um, the process within the kernel. Some of the structures uh, here I've talked about in the past, the e-process block, uh, which represents the process itself. The e-process block has pointers to things like, this process is handle table. So uh, how do we enumerate the handles on a process and so forth? Um, E-processes also point to threads within the process. This attack technique uh, uses the E-process block. It can target any E-process block it would like and then enumerates over the threads within that process. Um, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. Also within the kernel is the token of the process, handle tables, uh, the paging tables. So how do you do virtual to physical memory translation for this particular process. The user land portion of a process contains things like the process environment block, the thread environment block, and uh, the Windows subsystem, which the CR 
csrss.exe uses in order to communicate with the process uh, messages such as GUI messages and so forth. So if you want to inject into a process, uh, first of all, you have to find a suitable target. So we're injecting a DLL in this case into some target out there, and which one do you want? Well, obviously, if your intention is to bypass personal firewalls or um, gain access to perhaps uh, protected portions of the registry or the event log, um, you'll want to inject into those things that are trusted. So um, often Internet Explorer or Firefox, by default, is trusted for your personal firewall because you don't want that stupid warning message pop up each and every time. So if you eject in there, then your DLL will be able to connect out under many circumstances. Um, for the technique that we're using to inject, we're going to actually need to write some shellcode into the target process. So depending on how your shellcode is written, written you'll either need uh, kernel32.dll or um, ntdll.dll. We need to be able to, um, as well as that, we need to be able to change an existing thread within the target once we've allocated our shellcode uh, this thread will execute it. And we need to be able to allocate memory within the target process that we're infecting. And I'll talk about how you could do this from the kernel. We need to uh, write the shellcode up and uh, hijack a thread or uh, take over a thread and other means. So we'll change uh, context that we're currently running in. We're an evil driver. We're probably running in the system context. And therefore, in order to allocate memory in the target process, we need to change our view of memory to be that of the target. Uh, a lot of processes, or a lot of uh, IPS type of devices or software will prevent you from opening a handle to their process because they know the game's over. Like once you can get a handle, you can do a lot of things to them that are bad that Chris already talked about. Um, so they'll block actually open handle, or open process, I mean, so that you can't get a handle to the process. Therefore, you can't allocate memory in their process. Therefore, you can't create remote thread within their process, and so forth. However, there's two nice uh, kernel calls that you can make, called KE attach process and KE stack attach process. Both of them do the same thing. Uh, one's just been deprecated. Once you do that, <clears throat> the CR3 register changes. CR3 points to your page directory table base, which is responsible for all the virtual to physical memory translations. CR3 will change. Um, some other registers will change as well to put you in the full virtual context as far as memory goes of the target process. However, your execution state is still that of system or whatnot. So we're going to use a, a call within the kernel, ZW allocate virtual memory which would eventually be called, if you were using a user mode technique um, to do virtual alloc, it boils down to this function. We're going to use a negative one. Negative one is a magic handle that represents the current process. However, I told you that we're running in the current, our current execution context is that of system. However, if we use, after we do ke attach process and we use negative one, now our virtual alloc or ZW virtual alloc will be in the context of the target. So it does it all for us. We're going to commit the memory. Uh, you can actually reserve memory but not commit it. We're, we need to commit it because we're going to write to it. And then we can use um, the permission of page execute read write because we need to write code there that will execute. Our shell code is going to be fairly simple. Um, it's not going to do any of the interpreter tricks, it's going to actually load a file from disk for this example. We could have done the, the other way, but uh, it's just more than we don't write malware, so just talking about technique here. So we're going to call load library. Load library is going to do all the work for us that Chris already described, patch up the um, addresses and so forth. So in order to call load library, we need to get the address of that function within the target process space. Now, we can do this many different ways. Um, the old shellcode technique is to use the FS register. The FS register actually got changed when we called ZW, um, or I'm sorry, when we called KE attach process. 
So we can use um, FS to find the PEB eventually, the process environment block. In the PEB is the uh, PB loader data section, which contains a list of all the loaded modules within that process space. <clears throat> that would be a way that we could then parse the DLLs ourselves and find the address of NTDLL, find its export address for um, load library or the equivalent. Another way we could do this is we could just simply call ZW query system information. ZW query system information uh, in the kernel will return the list of all the drivers loaded as well as ntdll.dll, and it will give us the address. So we can then use the address of ntdll just to parse it directly. So now we've allocated the memory. We've written our shell code up there that calls load library and we've bypassed all the protection methods that currently exist. How do we get that to execute? Well, there's two common methodologies. We can either hijack an existing thread or we can um, schedule an APC within a thread. We'll talk about uh, hijacking an existing thread here. What would happen is every time a thread is um, swapped out for another thread to come in, the kernel needs to save off its context. So in, within the save context record is the save DIP, the instruction pointer, that will be the address of where execution resumes when that thread is scheduled again. So we can modify that EIP to be the address of the region of memory that we just allocated shellcode in and execute that way. The problem with this is that some threads are lower priority, so they don't run as often. So when you, <clears throat> for this attack to work reliably, you would have to figure out what uh, priority the thread's at and what its likelihood of getting scheduled again is. Also, some threads are blocked or they're in a waiting state because they're waiting on some shared resource and so forth or some IO operation to finish or whatnot. And uh, you need to also save the context back. So your little shell code for load library gets a little more complicated because after that executes, you then need to restore the save context that you overwrote the first time. Otherwise, the thread will never execute correctly again. This here is a structure uh, taken from WinDebug. WinDebug uh, will enumerate a lot of different structures for you if you have the symbols loaded and do the DT command. So this is what uh, context looks like for a thread. And you can see that there's an EIP value and some others in there. So I don't currently use that method. Um, an easier method to do is an APC. APC stands for Asynchronous Procedure Call. What you can do is you can schedule an APC for a particular thread. So the next time that thread fires, your APC will be executed. Every single E thread has an APC list of all the APCs in the queue that it needs to execute. Um, APCs are used for um, IO completions and things like that normally. However, we can use them to our advantage as well. So within the APC, when you create one of these objects, you tell the APC what code you want it to execute at the next time it runs. So we're going to have the address of the shell code that we just wrote up. And in order for an APC to fire, um, the thread actually has to be alertable. And